Okay, um, we're going to do the uh, MTTC clean room orientation safety lecture today. You're going to be in this clean room. The photograph there is of the clean room where you'll be working. So, um, in this bay, um, actually that's an older photograph. you got to get a newer one. But there's, uh, there's several pieces of equipment in there, and you have the yellow light. That's pretty common in clean rooms where you do photolithography. It's like a black, like, like a, um, what do they call them? Um, when you develop photographs, right? What is that called? Dark room. Dark room, thank you. In the dark room, you have red light, right? That's so you don't expose the film. Okay, in a clean room, you use yellow light because um, the, the light frequency that you use to expose <coughs> the resist on the wafers is a blue or green. Okay, so if you filter blue and green light out of the fluorescent tubes, you end up with yellow light. So all the clean rooms have yellow lights, they have yellow film across the windows, so you, you minimize the effect of, um, of blue light uh, pre-exposing your, your um, coated wafers. Okay, so you'll get more of this when you're at the clean room, um, you'll see these um, sheets up on the walls and at the emergency exits that have this information. Those sheets are intended to be there, so if there is an emergency, you just grab it on the way out, and then you can call these people. So Harold is the clean room manager. Uh, he has an office and a cell number and an emergency pager. I think he doesn't have the pager anymore, but he'll update that for us when we're there. And like I said, it's all on those sheets when you walk out, so you don't have to remember these numbers. Um, if you're inside the clean room and you dial 911 in the clean room on a clean room phone, you'll get the UNM police, and you're supposed to call the UNM police because they know where the buildings are, they know the exits, they know the lay of the land, and they will call in the fire department and all of that. Okay? So the fire department? No. And if you go out the emergency exit, the alarm goes off, so there's an immediate call in to UNM police. <coughs> okay? Good. So, but Harold will be with us. Um, the main thing that, that Harold and I always stress is that safety is the most important thing in the clean room. Okay? So, you've got to know your way around the clean room. So when we go out, that's why we do the tour. We show you where the emergency exits are. We also show you some of the support equipment and that sort of thing. But be, pay attention to where all those emergency exits are. Uh, we do have fire extinguishers, okay, that we use in the clean room. Um, Halitron fire extinguishers. They're designed to put out uh, electrical fires and like paper and that kind of stuff. We've never had to use one, as far as I know, um, but they're all over the place. There's, I think there's one in every day. There's a, there's a halotron extinguisher. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, halotron is what it's called. It's kind of like halon. Halon's used in like computer rooms. You know, if there's a computer fire, it's used for electrical fires, and uh, we 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 have halotron. Uh, fire extinguishers. What's that? Yeah. Yeah, we also have uh, CO2 extinguishing systems for the solvent. Um, it's not a sink, a solvent um, hood. It's a hood. It's a few hood. Uh, solvent hoods tend to be made out of metal because they don't burn. <coughs> okay? And, and the solvent hood. Um, that you'll be using when we strip our, our wafers um, has a CO2 system on it. So if there's a sense, if the fire sensor goes off, the CO2 will flood that. Of course, you want to leave the bay at that point because there won't be oxygen anymore in that bay. And if you don't have oxygen, you pass out really fast. <laughs> so yeah, if the bad. CO2 fire extinguisher goes off, you get out of the clean quickly. Yeah, the call compliance to the rescue to get you out. Yeah. Yeah. Harold and Sam are, are scuba certified, so they can put on the self contained breathing apparatus and come out and rescue you. Um, you got to understand where to put the
the wastes, right? You don't want to mix wastes like a solvent rag and an acid rag. You combine them <laughs> and get fire. You know, it's an exothermic reaction. So Which way is it supposed to go? It's supposed to be acid in the water? Acid in the water, yeah, the triple A rule. We'll get to that too. Okay? Understand chemical safety. There, uh, we'll get to it. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna give you the whole lecture on this page. So here are some more um, phone numbers. Again, these are posted at the emergency exits. That as you leave, in the event of an emergency, just grab one of those sheets, um, and then we can call the right people. And I'll tell you where the assembly point is. All right. First off, we gotta talk a little bit about what a clean room is. What do you think a clean room is? <laughs> it's very clean, right? It's supposed to be. It's cleaner than my son's bedroom. <laughs> it's cleaner than any room that you normally would work in, isn't it? It's designed to. Well, it's theory. Well, it's designed to be. Our our clean rooms are designed to be class 1000, which in today's standards is not a very clean environment, but it's clean enough. What what does that mean? If, if, does anybody know? Okay, it means that there are no more than a thousand half micron particles. And it should be larger. Okay, not smaller, but larger. So that hasn't been corrected from the original. Yeah. Is that no more than a thousand for the whole room? No, a thousand per foot, right? A thousand per cubic foot. Yeah, cubic, right? Volume. Square foot, there's there's nothing in a square foot. Because it has no volume. An area has no volume. It's a cubic foot. Okay? Right. So think think volume. So if you take a cubic foot of air and you count the particles in it that are half a micron and bigger, you'll get a thousand or less. That's what a class one thousand is. Um, the uh, the Intel Fab is a class one. It's only one half micron per No, cubic it's foot. better than that. It's one. And I think they use 0.1 micron. So a lot less ten. Uh, some of their clean rooms are class ten. Okay. Some of their clean environments are class one. Okay. Class class ten and class one is really hard to do. In fact, our clean room can reach class mm -hmm. ten when there's no one in there. The particle counts drop. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it from our schlubbing? Yeah, we're 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 filthy. I mean, you know, a person walks into a clean room and it just goes blah. Okay, <laughs> it just gets really dirty. And and we don't wear the same um, garb as like an Intel fab. They use full bunny suits, suits right? They use full bunny suits, right. So what's a bunny suit? A bunny suit is usually, um, I think it's Gore-Tex. They may have changed the materials. But when I was at uh, PI, we used Gore-Tex suits. And... Um, and they're cuffed, and then you you it's a full suit. It's like a jumpsuit, and it has a zipper on it. And you put this full jumpsuit on. You have a hood that you tuck in, uh, so you cover your whole entire head. And then you wear gloves, usually nitrile or latex. Those are the two types of gloves we use. And then we put boots over the the pant legs, and then we can go in the clean room. And we also had fab shoes. So we would change our shoes uh, when we entered the building from our street shoes to our building shoes, which were like these nice clean sneakers. Hmm. So everything was really pristine. You know, the floors were always mopped twice a day and that kind of thing, where the offices were. So, you know, that's what we did at TI. We were probably at class 10 at that time. That was a few years back. And probably class 10 with half a micron. Um, at Intel, they have the same thing. They have a full Gore-Tex suit, but they have a helmet. And the helmet has a um, um, uh, battery pack and an um, air filter hooked up to the back of the helmet. So air is drawn into the front of the helmet, out of the back of the helmet through a hose, through the external filter pack. Easy. Less claustrophobic, all that sort of thing. Well, it just keeps the air moving through your helmet, and that way the particles don't come out of your helmet into the cleaner. And it, and it goes through a HEPA filter and, it, and is exhausted below waste level. So most of the work you do with the wafers are at waste level or higher. So that's, that's one reason they do it that way. And now at Intel and other fabs, 
they have what are called uh, front opening <coughs> universal pods, and we used to have one here. This big one. That red one? Yeah, big red one. Oh, All right. So it's a workshop. oh no, it was back there. So it's called a foop. Now, the, the idea with the foops are that you can actually keep the environment inside of those pods much, much cleaner. And, and then you don't have to be as clean yourself. So in theory, you know, you can create a fab that has only foops and you don't need to clean them. But of course that never works because mm -hmm. particles find their way inside of things all the time. But um, that's another level of protection for your, for your um, product. So the reason we, we want a, a clean room is, is not to protect us, but to protect what we're making. And the smaller the gadgets we make, the cleaner it has to be. Out of curiosity, how do they? Because it seems like whenever you bring in any sort of solvent or anything like that, it's going to introduce certain particles. Yeah, and all that stuff. yeah, that's a good question. So whenever you bring anything in the clean room, you bring particles in. Uh, the chemicals themselves can produce particles. Um, well, I think we'll have some slides on that. How oh, yeah. um, is maintained clean? Uh, uh, <laughs> I didn't keep a clean room clean. Well, one thing to understand is why we have to keep it clean, right? The particles are like boulders. Okay, in this uh, scanning electron microscope picture, this is a, uh, That's a Sandia device. Okay, it's a, um, a device that uh, has a flip mirror on it. Okay, let me, let me point it out. This one. And not quite like a DMD. This is this is more of a um, a mirror that that comes out of the plane. So this rack pushes on the two flat plates. Right here's a plate. Here's a plate. It's anchored to the ground here. This is a slider. So this uh, this part will this rack will push on these two plates. This will pop up right out of the plane. And so you'll have these two plates come out of the plane, and then you can reflect light off of it. But the, the main thing that I wanted to show you is this uh, spider mite. <laughs> right? Spider mites are all over your house. There are probably several on your clothes. Uh, I'm not sure if these are the critters that live on your eyelashes. There's one critter that lives on your eyelashes. And if you don't have them, then you get infections and stuff. Because they actually keep your eyelashes clean. <laughs> Right, so they're there, they're really gross, but you never know that they're there, right? So, um, um, but if they, you know, this is a gross example. If one ends up on your part, it's not going to work, right? <laughs> right, these things are huge. But the, to give you a sense of scale, okay, this, uh, this gear here, I'm going to point it out with the computer. Right here, there's this little gear. It goes round and round and causes the rack to move. Okay, that little gear has gear teeth on it that are eight microns across, the size of a red blood cell. Okay, this gear itself is probably about 50 microns or so, which is half the width of your hair. The plates are maybe 100 microns wide, maybe a little thinner. So it gives you a sense of scale. And this is big stuff, right? Sandia also makes computer chips and Intel. The Intel chips have parts in them, transistor gates, that are 0.2 microns or less. Okay? So, you know, orders of magnitude smaller, some of the device components. So, so imagine a particle, right? If a particle lands on a transistor while you're processing it, that's a tenth of a micron, you just shorted out that transistor. So you can see why it's very important to stay clean. You'll notice if you take the next fabrication class when we make our um, pressure sensors, after just about every step, we go through a clean process. Right? The wafers are stripped of resist, they're put in a cleaner, they go to the spin rinse dryer. You know, there's a lot of cleaning. Yeah. Isn't the, uh, when you strip it off, doesn't that create part of it? Um, the, when you strip the resist? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. That's why you have to clean everything off. I mean, it's all a liquid process when you do the strip. They do do plasma stripping too, which which causes the um, organic resist to become like ash, like burn 
turns it off and they pump it out. So all the hoods have air being pumped out right through the scrubbers. So when you do your work inside the hoods and you're producing fumes, they're all sucked out of the fat through the through the scrubbers. They go through the scrubbers and then they're and then the exhaust is environmentally safe, you know. Um, actually, you know, this kind of technology is pretty clean industry. And they're getting to the point where they use very, very little chemicals, because chemicals are expensive. They have to be ultra pure, ultra clean when you're making these things. And so there's a drive in industry to use fewer and fewer chemicals, less and less chemicals. So the so the toxic waste stream is very small. Um, you know, at, at uh, Texas Instruments, we would we would collect our photoresist waste in 80 gallon drums, and they would pick them up maybe once a month, a few drums, and then they would take them and they'd incinerate them at very high temperatures so that there was no toxic emission into the waste stream. So that's the other other side note. Um, it's a very clean environment because the, <coughs> the materials have to stay clean, the devices have to stay clean. Um, we're the biggest source of contamination. Humans are the biggest source of contamination in a clean room. Um, if you read the, the reading assignment, it's, I can't remember the exact number. It's on the order, I think, of, of 10,000 particles per minute come off of you, right? Because you have to replace your, your top layer of skin every day or two or something like that. So someone did the calculation of how many particles that is, and it's, it's 10 million per hour or some insane, or maybe it's per minute. It's, a, it's in the write-up. So pay attention to that. It's a big number. So you can see why, you know, why it's so hard to keep a clean room clean. I mean, look at your house, even if it's sealed from the weather and you keep it real nice and clean and you clean your air filters and all that, you still get dust building up. And that's a lot of particles. Okay? So we shed thousands of particles per second, right? So probably on the order of millions per minute, per hour. There's a lot of particles. You're not supposed to wear makeup in a clean room, so don't wear makeup. Well, you know, we, men put hair gel in and stuff like that. Don't do that. Oh, on so that no day. hair gel or anything like that even? Yeah, yeah. It, it creates particles. So try not to, to come with that. Oh, and uh, yeah. colognes have a, they have a powder associated with it? Yeah, some colognes, yeah. I mean, if you smell something, it's producing particles. It could be just large molecules. I mean, that's the other question, right? When is it a particle? When is it a molecule? Okay, if you go small enough, they become molecules, right? They're not real particles anymore. So, well, those um, keep getting smaller and smaller. That's going to screw things up too. Yeah, yeah. You have to you have to scrub the bad molecules out of the air down the road. And if you smoke, they always say don't smoke for at least 20 minutes before you go into the fab. At Texas Instruments, they had a water fountain in the change room, and you were required to take a drink of water before you go in the fab if you smoke. And the idea there is there's a lot of particles associated with smoke. When you smoke cigarettes, or pipes, or whatever, cigars, and the idea there is, is, you know, you're exhaling particles for quite some time. So if you wait 20 minutes, the number of particles goes down. I remember when I worked with Intel up there, at the, um, when they were building the Fab 11, uh -huh. they had um, real construction workers came in, they had the, these signs posted up on the walls, you know, if you have any tobacco, don't even bother bringing them in. Yeah, they don't, they, you know, nowadays, most companies don't even want you to smoke. Um, I don't know if there are any companies that actually made a rule you can't smoke. But they make it so difficult. <laughs> we went through this evolution at Texas Instruments. It was real interesting. You know, about half of the people who worked there smoked, you know, back in the old days, right? Seventies and stuff. And then when I started working there, there was a big campaign to reduce smoking and you actually got a better rate on your on your insurance premium if you quit smoking. And they 
pay for smoking cessation and all of that. Uh, and then they, they said the, the remainder who were still smoking, they could smoke, but they had to like walk a quarter of a mile from the building. And, and they were allowed to smoke far, far away. And so, you know, you have this group of three or four people way out there, and they, you know, you don't feel good about that, right? If you're way out in the boonies, everybody's looking at you. So they yeah, kind of smoking. they kind of encourage people to quit smoking, and that, it's a good thing. So they also had prohibitions up there, like yeah, you know, for chewing tobacco, because a lot of these guys would chew and spit it in cans. And oh stuff. yeah, chewing tobacco is not not good. I mean, they, you can't eat in the fab, you can't chew gum, you can't eat hard candy, you can't do any of that. Um, and there's reasons for that, other than just creating particles. There's also health risks when you chew gum in a fab, believe it or not. So we shed skin particles. Um, we have salt and calcium ions and all of that kind of stuff floating around in our bodies and on our fingers. So if you, if you touch a wafer, or if you touch something that touches a wafer with your bare hands, you're going to leave some ions behind, even metal ions. Um, and then those ions will actually migrate within the silicon crystal over time. Um, you can actually have a computer chip fail six months, a year, two years after you make it because of you know, ions, mobile ions collecting around transistors and things like that. Okay? Because whenever you have a an electronic circuit, you're going to have voltages, and those voltages will drive charged particles, will cause them to move, even in a crystal. Okay, so a lot of people have habits, and we all have this. We touch our head, we scratch our nose, right? Just out of habit. We don't even know we're doing it. Um, you'll find a lot of clean rooms, a lot of workers. If they see you doing that, touching your forehead or scratching your nose, they'll say, go change your gloves. Right? Because you just contaminated your gloves. <laughs> okay. Plus, if you have anything on your gloves, you don't want to put it on your forehead or in your eye or, or something like that. Generally speaking, though, you're not going to touch any chemicals with your hands. You always have a holder or something. The, the gloves are, the chemical gloves are there to protect, protect you in the event that you splash. Something bad happens. Yes. Are we supposed to know what the design of one edge? Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about that. You'll you'll create your own mask. Um, for the fab part. So anything that goes in the cleaner has to be wiped down, and it's usually isopropyl alcohol and water mix. You spray a, a chem wipe or a clean room wipe, and then you wipe it down. So if you bring a laptop in or you bring a, a camera in, you're allowed to bring a camera in. Make it just slightly damp. You don't want to get your camera wet, right? But damp so you can you can pull off the particles off the outside and clean off any of the residual oils. But feel free to bring a camera in. Okay, just wipe it down. We're okay with that. Um, yeah. So we want to make sure everything coming in the fab is clean. You also use special pens, so you can't bring your own pen or your own pencil in. We have some pens at the door of the clean room and some clean room paper. Okay, so the clean room paper is designed not to shed particles, and the uh, pens um, have been tested and they don't have any ions in them. Out of curiosity, how expensive is that? The cheapest pens you can buy are the best ones. They're usually the BIC, you know, buy a box for 50 cents type oh, of so pens. Oh, so just yeah, standard it's, pens? Yeah, the really cheapo ones are the best ones. That's what we found at TI. It was bizarre. <laughs> you know. Well, you know, if you get a fancy gel pen and, and it glides and all that, they have all kinds of stuff in there. Yeah. You know, they have tungsten ball bearings and they have, you know, <laughs> all sorts of things to make that ink glide on and look pretty and be shiny and all that, but then you're adding a bunch of junk to the ink. So it's a pencil that doesn't know. Now pencils aren't because they're partic particle generators. The graphene isn't bad. It's just that, you know, those particles get on your on your products. Sure. Yeah, you don't want to have a pencil sharpener and a cleaner. Exactly. Okay, so what takes place? Well, we use lots of chemicals, right? I keep alluding to that. Um, we alter the surface of the wafer using chemicals. And most of the time it's wet chemicals. Um, but we do are we're increasing
increasingly using more and more dry chemical etch uh, processes. Uh, we use acids, bases, and solvents. So those all have their own inherent hazards associated with them. And um, they also have shown that some of the chemicals may affect an unborn fetus. So the UNM rule for their fab is if you think you're pregnant, you don't go into the clean room. Okay? Oh, what timing. So if you think you're pregnant, you don't go into the clean room. Oh, I hope. Okay? So we'll excuse you from that. Um, there used to be some chemicals used in uh, photoresist that was really bad and caused miscarriages at a slightly higher rate than the general population. IBM did a study on it. And as a result of that study, they changed the solvent. And they've done lots of studies on people who work in clean rooms. And for, for most things, there's, there's really no statistical difference in, in the rate of cancer and that kind of thing. Uh, and some people even believe that if you work in a clean room, you're actually going to end up being a little bit healthier because they filter the air so much. I thought there was so. a template that for carcinogenic. What, what's carcinogenic? Some, some of the special chemicals that we use for uh, etching and things like that. Yeah, some of the, uh, the chemicals are carcinogenic that you wear for personal protective equipment. So you never get in contact with them. And they're inside of um, fume hoods. They don't breathe anything. You know, everything's exhausted. So I'll go outside? Yeah, the people down the street get cancer. I'm kidding. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very safe, safe environment. That's I'm just amazed at how safe clean rooms are. Do they have scrubbers on the roof or something? They have scrubbers, yes, on the, on the roofs. Um, most of the exhaust is like acid exhaust fumes, and so um, they scrub that out of the um, air to reduce acid rain, right? And all a scrubber is is a bunch of water sprayers that spray over um, these um, plastic cubes. They look kind of like the origami cubes with lots and lots of holes in it. And they'll have baskets of these um, and they'll pump plastic the air through cubes. And the water through. Exactly. They, they spray water over these cubes to increase the surface area of the water. The surface area is very, very large inside of the scrubber that the water um, covers, that surface area. And then as the air passes over it, anything in the air gets dissolved into the water. And then once you capture it in water, you can treat it. Most of the time, it's just acidic. So you just uh, neutralize it. And then you can put it in the regular waste stream of the city water supply. Don't they miss a little through a big water tank? Um, it's actually more efficient to do it with the scrubbers. Uh, bubbling, you all, the only surface area you have is the surface of the bubble. But if you have micro droplets spraying all the time over a okay. cage filled with structures that you know the water coats, you have a lot more surface area. So that's a good that's a good thought, right? You could bubble it. Um, you always have to wear clean room attire. So when you come to the clean room to work in the clean room, we request that you wear long pants, don't wear shorts, closed shoes, no flip-flops or sandals or open-toed shoes. That's because usually if you spill something, it goes down where your feet are. So it adds another level of protection or if you drop something and it lands on your foot, it don't hurt your foot. Um, Harold likes us to wear shirts with sleeves, and he actually says short sleeves are preferred. And there's, there's a good point to that. If you get any chemicals on a long sleeve shirt, it tends to stick to your skin more, right? And you increase the contact with the skin in terms of time. And, um, and you can actually cause more damage to your skin if you have long sleeves. Uh, the fabs I've worked in, they never specified, you know, the shirt and sleeve length, but uh, Harold prefers to wear short sleeves. Um, so assuming you have the right clothes when you arrive, because if you don't have long pants or if you have open-toed shoes or any of those things, you won't be able to go in the clean room. Okay? So make sure you dress appropriately. 
I, I suggest you dress pro appropriately for the tour as well, because you will be in the clean room, you just won't be in the very clean part of the clean room for the tour. And that'll make you get used to getting dressed properly. Okay, so when you go to the clean room, you have to put on some, um, some uh, attire, a hairnet, like they would wear, you know, food service business. Um, you'll get some shoe covers, the blue shoe covers that you see often in hospitals. I'll wear those. A face mask with a, to cover your face. Is anybody allergic to uh, latex? No. No one's allergic to latex. Okay. We do have non-latex face covers as well. So if you know if you're allergic to latex, let us know. We'll make sure that we find some face covers for you that have no latex in it. <coughs> and also the stretchy part of the hairnet has latex in it. I had one student who was allergic to latex and she didn't know it. And then she got this big red mark across her forehead <laughs> from the hairnet. And we said, ah, oh, you must be allergic to latex. So we got her a special um, hood to wear. And then we have smocks that are um, Tyvex. Okay, they're not the Gore-Tex, like you have at Intel or at CMU National Labs. It's a Tyvex smock. You wear that with some latex or nitrile gloves. I prefer nitrile gloves myself. I can feel better through it. I always like those better. But some people prefer the latex. You can pick which one you like. We have safety glasses. Um, if you wear glasses, you should wear safety glasses over your glasses, unless you have prescription safety glasses. If you work in a clean room, oftentimes they will, um, the company will provide you with prescription safety glasses. Um, otherwise, you just wear, we have special safety glasses that go over, you know, regular optical glasses that work pretty well, and that's what I do. Um, if you have contacts, don't wear them that day. No contacts allowed in the clean room. Why is that? Um, because the, sometimes if there's a chemical spill or splash or there's chemical fumes, it'll collect on the, uh, on the contact or get underneath the contact. And if it's severe, you know, the contact could fuse to your cornea or something like that. Because oh, wow. your eye doesn't keep, keep yeah. your cornea clean if there's something over it. Yeah. Right? And so we just have a rule. We're ultra safe. In our clean room. Other clean rooms say they recommend not wearing contacts. It's at your own risk. And they make you sign a waiver. So if something happens, too bad, you can't sue us. We just say you can't wear them, period. So if you wear contacts, and most of us do these days, um, just don't wear them that day. Bring your glasses. Yeah. Okay. And do the, the gloves, latex or natural? Uh, if you're working with an acid, let's say, with one or the other. Um, we have chemical gloves that go over the nitrile or latex gloves. The nitrile or latex gloves are before you go in to even go into the clean room. You always have to wear those gloves for when you handle the wafers and that kind of thing. Okay, so no makeup, no contacts. All right. Downing procedures. You start with your shoe covers, then your hairnet, your face covers, cover. Gloves, smock, and safety glasses in that order. The order matters. You will have a question on this on the test. Okay? Um, since at TI we had, um, we had back shoes, so we started from the top down. That's how we were trained. So we did the hood, right? I think we put gloves on first. That's probably what we did. We put gloves on first, and then we put the hood, the bunny suit, the booties, um, and worked our way down. The rule was head down. But here you put shoe covers first, then the hairnet, face cover, gloves, smock, safety glasses. There's a mirror in there that you can look at yourself, look at your buddies, make sure they put everything on right. Um, if you leave the fab, like you have to go to the restroom or something, you got to replace your shoe covers, hair net, and face masks. Now we're trying to be a little greener, so you can take your shoe covers, hair net, and face mask off and put it in a cubby hole, and then you can go out to the hallway 
do your business, and when you come back in, then you can put those back on again. So we can recycle these now. Okay. We're trying to be greener, but we're exhausting chemicals into the air. So we yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like here's some chemicals for you, but you know, be green over there. So we're going to be going to the MTTC. I'll talk. I'll talk to you about it after the lecture. Okay. And I'll get you back up to speed. Um, the smocks we get rid of every semester, and if there's any damaged, uh, you know, like like if you tear your shoe cover or something, you should replace it, okay, immediately. If the, some of the smocks have some slight holes in it and stuff, but we're still using them. Um, Harold tries to replace them every semester or so, the worn out ones. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention, the first thing. You'll notice there are tacky mats when you enter the clean room, and they're in, in several places whenever you enter. They're sticky. So when you step on them, you know, you feel like you're sticking to the floor. And the purpose is, is it pulls off the uh, particles off the bottom of your shoe. So you're supposed to take like five little baby steps when you go over a tacky mat to make sure you get most of the particles off. It helps keep the clean room cleaner. Okay? I shouldn't wear my hiking boots. Don't wear your hiking boots. <laughs> it's not comfortable either. Sneakers are pretty good. So this, this is what you're going to look like after you put all the garb on. You can see you have a smock, you know, safety glasses, hair net, face cover. Uh, this person's wearing nitrile gloves. Okay? So that's an older picture. Uh, we don't have these pieces of equipment in the clean room anymore. We have other ones, but <laughs> you can see that's basically what you look like. Okay? And you don't want too much skin showing, so button everything up. In in um, TI and and Intel, you know, you wouldn't have any skin showing. It'd all be covered. All right. So once you're gone, you can enter the fab. All items entering the fab have to be wiped off with IPA and water. I already mentioned that. If you smoke, you have to uh, not smoke for at least 20 minutes before going in the clean room. Uh, and it's always a good idea to get a drink of water if you're a smoker to get rid of the particles that might still be in your mouth and your throat. Um, don't open your smock or or take your gloves off in the clean room to get something out of your pocket if your cell phone goes off. You can leave the clean room, right, and go in the hall to answer it. But you really don't want to touch your phone with your gloves. <laughs> so then you got to replace your gloves, right? Because your phone's got all kinds of body oils and particulates well, in there. Clean the phone off like you would the laptop or. Well, Harold will, will, will answer his cell phone in the clean room, but he's the only one allowed to do that. Okay. Okay, so, so and the other thing is, is if, like, if you're in acid gear, you definitely do not want to leave the clean room in acid gear. Um, because you're gonna, you might have a drop of chemicals on your glove, and if you touch the doorknob, someone who's not in acid gear, you get cross-contaminated, or if you try to take your phone out of your pocket and your glove has got acid on it, he knows what that acid is going to end up, right? Okay, so that's the whole point of this. It's to remain safe. Okay, so if you have acid gear on, you don't do anything but acid work. Okay, you don't go to the microscope and look at your wafer when you have a face shield and apron and acid gloves on because you're going to cross-contaminate the microscope. <laughs> okay, you take off your acid gear, and then you can inspect your way first. So, so, so given the crushes that you currently do, okay, I'm sure that things will still get uh, contaminated as far as uh, your product is concerned. Okay, are there kind of statistics about how many defects okay, are produced? Okay, sure. Sure. The defects, there, there's a whole group in the semiconductor factories that are called um, defect density. All they do is look for defects and try to identify where they're coming from. You can have one defect on a chip that causes the chip not to function. 
Okay, now think of the Intel chips. They're pretty big. They're probably 20, 30, no, probably 25 by 25 millimeters. So you have one particle on there in the right place, you wipe out the whole chip. Okay? How many chips can you put on a wafer? If it's an 8 inch wafer and they're big chips, you might only have 50 chips on it. Right? If you have 10 particles there, you wipe out 10 chips out of the 50. Well, you do 30 or 40 layers, and you do 10 particles per layer, you have nothing that works at the end. Okay, so particles are a big deal, and, and defect density is a huge deal. Now, most of the time, the particles land in a place that don't, don't do anything. You have a lot of space, too, on a chip. So it just depends where the particle lands. Um, but the, the basic idea is, is try to keep everything as clean as possible. And, and like when you're walking in the fab or moving in the fab, you, you move slowly to reduce turbulence. Because if you stir up or move fast, you're going to produce more particles and you're going to cause more turbulence. In the clean room, you have laminar airflow. Does anybody know what laminar airflow is? Is the desire to tear down or? Okay. Uh, air will travel unhindered okay, by uh, adjacent uh, obstacles okay, and it's like a, it's a flow okay, and so you have this stratification of uh, layers okay, that are flowing through. Yeah, so if you've ever seen like wind tunnel uh, movies where they have like the smoke stream go over the wing mm -hmm. and they'll have several of them, several streams, and you'll see they'll all be in parallel to each other as they go around obstacles, that's because you have a constant flow of air, okay, going through the wind tunnel. Well, think of a wind tunnel at 90 degrees. The air is going from the ceiling to the floor. Everything's moving in straight lines. All the air is moving in straight lines. That means if there's a particle that comes off of something, it'll go in the stream and get pushed down all the way to the floor. That's called laminar airflow. Of course, when you walk through the fab, where you have equipment in the fab, the air's got to go around it. And it becomes more turbulent and less laminar. And then the efficiency of pushing those particles to the floor is lower. <coughs> okay, so the ceiling has HEPA filters, high efficiency particle attenuators, also known as high efficiency particle air. The industry changed the name halfway through. You'll, hear it, you'll see it in your reading. These uh, HEPA filters are designed to take particles out of the air. And they're in a folded design, kind of like an accordion. So you can have a huge surface area over a small volume. So think of a piece of paper as a filter. If you just have the piece of paper by itself, you just have one surface, right? Now take that paper and fold it like an accordion. You'll need a lot more paper, and you can cover a bigger surface area. Volume and have a huge surface area. So now you can make the paper very, very um, fine, very dense, and still flow a lot of air through it, but any particles in there will get stuck inside the filter. So the filters are made out of polymer fibers and glass fibers usually, and particles like to stick to that. So you'll have, you'll see in the tour, and Harold will point it out, that there are HEPA filters on the ceiling all the air gets pushed through the HEPA filters. So the particles are taken out of the air. And the whole fab is balanced to give you laminar airflow. So the air comes straight down and goes out loopers on the holes in the wall. And then you'll see every other hallway in the clean room is a chase. So you have a bay where you do your work with the wafers. And then you have a chase where the equipment is, the dirty equipment. And so the air goes down inside the bay, goes out the louvers on the floor, or along the floor, into the chase, and gets sucked back up and is recycled. Now, of course, a lot of the air gets pumped out of the clean room through the uh, hoods, right? All of the, the wet chemical hoods. That air has to be made up. And you do want to make up the air, because you'll run out of oxygen after a while and <laughs> seal it, right? So there's always air coming in from the outside, fresh air, which is filtered and conditioned for specific humidity and temperature. So we keep the humidity at 42% relative humidity, plus or minus 100%. And we keep the 
temperature in the clean room at about 70 degrees. Why do we do that? Because chemistry is very dependent on the temperature and humidity. And every once in a while you have to change the numbers too. The filters are changed very rarely because they can hold a lot of dirt. And they're pre-filtered too. You have standard air filters on the outside. Those get washed or it's changed out all the time because the dust in New Mexico is pretty prevalent. So you get 95% of the big stuff out of the air. So whatever goes through the big gross filters that we all have in our homes and most businesses have, then they go through the HEPA filters which get the fine stuff. Okay? So back to what's on the screen. Always have a buddy. Okay? You can't work in the clean room by yourself. There are, there are rules about that. Texas Instruments, when I worked there, they, their rule was line of sight. Someone had to be in line of sight of you. Yeah, yeah, I was I was once working in the clean room, a bunch around noisy equipment on a scanning electron microscope, right? And no one was over there. And an alarm went off and everybody left the building. I was still working. I didn't hear the alarm. I didn't see the flashing light. You know? So I was a test case. And what they do is when everybody leaves, they have an emergency response team that does a sweep to make sure no one passed out and was left in the clean room. So the emergency response team, and luckily it was just a drill, did a sweep and they came running up to me and screamed at me, you're supposed to leave the fab during an alarm. And I go, what alarm? And they looked around and noticed you couldn't see it, you couldn't hear it where I was. So they, they put one of those flashing things right behind where my head was the next time. So. <laughs> <laughs> right? But, you know, that's a lesson to learn. That happens in industry all the time. You think you got everything covered and something happens and you go, oh, we didn't think of that. And then you fix it. The problem you run into is if you find a problem and you don't fix it. Or if somebody gets hurt between the time it's, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's so safe. I mean, I've never seen anybody really get hurt. I mean, we've had heart attacks in the fab, but that happens everywhere. Um, you know, we've had people pass out from diabetic crashes. They had, and they had a guy, one of the construction workers up at Intel. Uh -huh. He was up there, and they had something where some acid came loose, and he was wearing the acid suit, and he was running to the showers, and as he was running to the showers, he was taking the suit off. Instead of waiting until oh. he... Yeah, so he got that stuff all over him before he... He panicked, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the emergency response teams, they practice stuff like, um, I had technicians on the emergency response teams that I supervise, and they tell me some of the training. And they have to put on these um, environmental suits, you know, plastic blue suits, mm -hmm. with its own air and all of that. And it's really confining, and some people just go nuts when they first put it on because it's claustrophobic and it just depends on your nature. And, and so they practice in these suits. It gets real hot, it's claustrophobic, but they, they make them wear them for two hours at a time and stuff like that. And then once they get through that, then they make them wear it and they put something over their face, a face shield so they can't see and they have to grope their way around because that happens too. You know, the lights go off or, or smoke. You know, they gotta not panic and rip everything off. They gotta find their way out um, in that. But those are for the ERT guys. Usually you're out of the fab before, you know, the smoke gets bad. <laughs> and all so, that. <laughs> <laughs> so the ERT is normally just a They're trained technicians. It's just technicians. Just so well, yeah, at the bigger companies, yeah. And, and they get paid extra. At mm -hmm. TI, they got a pay hike. But they had to do training and stay certified. Up at Intel, Fab 7? The ERT guys would text that they would, you know, when something happened, they would drop it and do the ERT stuff. Right. Well, like the emergency, well, like volunteer firemen. Yeah, but with, not, with Fab 9 and 11, I mean, they had their ERT was ERT, period. Oh, they had a separate group? Yep. And then they, and later on, they, yeah. made, they did the same thing with Fab 7, I think. Yeah. Well, it's, it's good. I mean, it's always good. It, a lot of times, ERTs made as part of security for the security guards or ERT guys. They get paid yeah. extra. You know, but if there's an emergency, they get gowned up and go in and, and rescue people. There's a lot of, um, in the old days, uh, Texas Instruments had a case 
um, let's see if I remember this right. Over the, the Christmas holidays, they would shut down because most people went off. And they also had to do electrical testing at least once a year. It was an OSHA requirement where they shut all the electricity off and then turn it back on, you know, and check all of the, the big uh, um, breakers. Yeah, you know, the 100 amp breakers, you know, the big ones. They want to make sure they're going to work, right? Yeah. So they test all of these high voltage systems over the break. But while everybody's out of the clean room, they're pumping nitrogen through the equipment to keep it clean. They're pumping nitrogen through cabinets that are holding wafers because they don't want things to oxidize. Okay? But you're pumping all this nitrogen in a room. And not ventilating it out. And it's not ventilating. Ooh. So these process guys can't, even, you know, then when you turn the fab back on, you send in people to go through and start turning equipment on. Usually you only need a couple people. They come in a few hours before start turning the equipment on so they can all boot up, get to operating temperature and stuff, and then they start running tests. Well, at TI in one of the fabs, you know, they have the buddy system, which was good in this case. They got gowned up. One guy goes into the clean room. He gets four steps in and passes out. <laughs> the other guy's going, what's going on? Right? Now, he did something you're not really supposed to do, but he took a deep breath held his breath, went in and drugged the other guy out, which was a good thing at the time. Usually you don't do that, because you might end up going on the floor too. Yeah. You're supposed to get a Scott Air Pack, right? Uh, the breathing apparatus, and then go in. Because you don't know why he's passed out. But they found out that the room was full of nitrogen and had no oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> Oxygen's not poisonous, but the lack of oxygen is. You know, nitrogen, Nitrogen's not poisonous. It's so, so those are some things to you know keep keep in mind. And then another another accident was they were cutting through some uh, gas lines. No. Okay, and they they were cutting through what they thought was a nitrogen line, which had been turned off. But they got confused. It was a chlorine line that wasn't turned off. So there's a chlorine leak. Chlorine gas is not very help helpful. No one got hurt, but you know the sensors went off right away. The chlorine line was shut down, but you know what was the lessons learned? They labeled all the lines every four feet, what was in them, mm -hmm. right? Oh, yeah. so, yeah. And so they never had that problem again. Well, they had one of the Intel where they were running nitrogen, supposed to be running nitrogen to the equipment, mm -hmm. and instead they pumped. They, when they had silane. Yeah, silane is nasty stuff. Yeah, if you put that in a nitrogen line, um, things go boom. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're, they're looking for leaks, and all of a sudden, you know, this flame comes up, and the guy's like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, silane is pyrophoric. It, it will ignite when it hits air. Oh, wow. And we have silane in our guy. What is it used for? Uh, it's used for uh, polysilicon deposition. Okay. So if you're going to um, put a layer of polycrystalline silicon down, um, you need a source of silicon, and silane is SiH4. So that's your silicon. Yeah, and then when you put down silicon nitride, you use silane and ammonia. Ammonia provides the nitrogen, and the silane <coughs> provides the silicon. So you have to do it uh, like it's a vapor. Close. Yeah, it's done in a diffusion furnace in a tube. Chemical vapor deposition is what they call that. I think we talked about it a little bit. Yeah. We'll get more on that in the next course. But chemical vapor deposition is, is it's chemistry done in vapor form instead of what you normally do in, in, in a chemistry lab, which is all liquid, right? You, you can do a lot more chemistry a lot faster um, in vapor form. But then you have to evacuate the chamber so the other chemicals aren't in there. So you need vacuum equipment, so it's good to know vacuum systems. And then if you want the chemical reaction to occur faster, you do it under heat. Okay? And if you want it to go really fast, you can do it under plasma, which is exciting <coughs> gases using a, a radio frequency source to heat up the gas and then it glows. What's inside of your fluorescent tube is plasma. The fourth state of matter as well. But I keep going off on tangents. It's interesting. 
But whoever listens to this lecture is going to go, you know, this is a four-hour safety lecture. Only one hour of it's safety. <laughs> okay. You got to plan your day, right? Go to the bathroom before you go in the clean room. Speaking of which. <laughs> oh, we need a break? Yeah. All right. Let me get through this slide, and then I'll pause things and we'll take a break. You got to plan your day. Uh, make sure you bring what you need, you know, your notebook or pads, paper, whatever. No, uh, clean room paper. Because um, it's a drag to decon. And then if you're with the class, then one of the instructors has to get you out of the fab and then swipe you back in. And then we have one less person in the clean room. So um, we try to make our sections like two to three hours. Uh, but I've spent 12 hours in the clean room before working. Don't drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> you know? But sometimes you have to just get stuff done. Um, uh, all non-computer controlled operations must be attended to at all times. So you don't leave things bubbling in a sink of acid and then leave. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Um, that kind of stuff, or, or put things on a, on a hot plate, right? Because what happens? The stuff evaporates, right? Mm -hmm. or, or the flask breaks because it gets too hot. You have a runaway situation. The hot plate gets shorted out, starts on fire. That actually happened with a small tech company in Albuquerque. They left the hot plate on and burned down a fab that wasn't their fab because they were using the space. So they have a big red scarlet letter on their forehead. Right? Nobody wants to have them work in their fat. Don't eat, drink, or smoke in the lab. That's obvious, right? Well, it might not be obvious why you can't drink, but you know, you, there's a, always a slight possibility that chemicals will be absorbed. If your mouth is wet or you're chewing gum all the time, you're going to absorb some, maybe some residual um, vapors that might be in the air. So there's another way to ingest um, chemical that might not work well with you. Um, very low risk, but it's just a rule, right? We minimize every risk we can. So you shouldn't be eating or drinking. Also, your hands might cross-contaminate something. There was a real big deal at um, Texas Instruments. The guys who worked in implant would work with arsenic yeah, um, targets, right? For their implanters, arsenic will kill you. <laughs> <laughs> right? So they had carts that was labeled arsenic contaminated, even though they weren't really contaminated because they had everything sealed. But they put the targets on the cart and took it into the fab. And they had different colored gloves, some weird colored gloves, because you can't use those gloves for anything else because they may have arsenic on it. They wear respirators with filters on it. And you know they said arsenic contaminated. We just assumed everything that they got close to was contaminated with arsenic. <coughs> but no one ever got arsenic poisoning. Yeah, that one's even worse. They use that stuff in the 